Good morning. I want to start this morning by welcoming you all, and especially those of you joining us online. We hope if you're able, you'll join us in person here soon. If this is your first time, we would encourage you to, on your way out to grab one of the purple welcome bags, or if it's your second or third time, if you haven't gotten one of those yet, feel free to grab that on your way out. And there's a connection card in there. We would love to have you fill out so we can get connected with you. We're also glad to have our Uganda team back as they arrived safely uh, back home a few days ago. So uh, Pastor Keith, Nate, and Isaac, welcome back. Awana registration is open. That'll be starting again on Wednesday evenings, beginning September 14th, and that'll run through May. We do still need a few helpers, so if you are able and interested, please let me or Pastor Dick know. And for those of you with kids, feel free to start registering them as well. We have a back-to-school prayer blitz coming up uh, next Sunday. It'll go from 1.30 to about 4.15. We're going to meet in front of Donegal High School and then travel to the different schools in the Mount Joy community to pray. So we encourage everyone to come be a part of that. Transportation will be provided. So again, you'll meet at the high school. And then Justin and Scott. Good morning. Good morning. It is with uh, mixed emotion that I uh, share this with the uh, congregation that uh, I have decided to resign my position as council president effective immediately uh, and have uh, resigned my position as elder uh, effective August 31st. Uh, it has been an absolute privilege and high honor to serve our pastors, our church, our staff, this body of um, believers here at this congregation, and ultimately our Lord and Savior, um, Jesus Christ, in a variety of leadership roles and capacities since 2019. It has been my joy and delight uh, to have been able to utilize my God-given talents um, and gifts to advance his kingdom uh, in the ministry of this church uh, while serving our brothers and sisters both inside the church and outside the church. Um, I had fully intended to fulfill my term uh, on council ending December 2024 and finish a lot of the valuable work that we had begun um, as I was council president and attempting to lead and guide that body of believers. Um, while recently getting married was a factor, um, there is a lot of other stuff going on in my life that uh, has just been very clear. I spent a lot of time praying about this. It was not an easy decision, and the Lord made it clear that uh, now is the time. So. Uh, was something that I greatly wrestled with, but after a great deal of prayer, like I said the Lord was very clear that now is the time to step aside. Um, not exactly how I envisioned ending my time as an elder, uh, but I would like to be obedient to the Lord's will. I'd like to sincerely thank Scott Hershey, uh, who has been serving as acting president for the past couple of months in my absence um, during our time of transition as well. He's done a phenomenal job, and I can't speak highly enough about that. I'll continue to work to support council in finishing up a lot of the work that we were working on, getting things ready, and continuing to serve uh, our pastors and our staff uh, into the foreseeable future, albeit in different roles. Um, it has been a blessing to serve this body, uh, and uh, I greatly appreciate the opportunity that it has been to, to serve. Uh, on Monday night, council uh, elected Scott uh, president. Um, so please continue to support him and uh, keep him in your prayers. Um, and then also Zach Trague as vice president. Um, Scott, I'd like to thank you for your willingness to serve and appreciate your faithful service. And Justin, I thank you for uh, the hard work that you put in to you know, get us where we, we are. Um, and I just appreciate uh, the opportunity to serve with you. Um, just some some housekeeping. Um, don't go away. Some housekeeping. Just so that, that you folks are aware, when vacancies um, are come about in, in the, on the council, the Constitution says all vacancies for un, unexpired terms caused by resignation or otherwise shall be filled by the church council. So the council's going to work. I mean, Justin's not done yet, so we're obviously not going to fill his position, but 
um, that time comes, um, we're, we're working on getting a replacement. And just a reminder that uh, nominations will be coming up for the, the church uh, congregational meeting will be October 22nd. So at that time, all members will be able to vote for um, re, you know, replacement for folks who are going off council. So that'll be a, an elder, a deacon, and a trustee. We don't have any names yet. They're, the committee's still working on that. So before we go, I want to I pray. Justin, Father God, we thank you for, for Justin's work and his, his love for you and his, his uh, faithful service. And um, Lord, he, is, he has a lot going on in his life. And uh, so, Lord, we pray you give him the strength and stamina uh, as he takes on those tasks. And uh, I've said many times to several people, it's really cool to be able to say, tell Justin when I hang up from the phone talking to him that go home and give your lovely wife a hug. So thanks for blessing uh, Justin with Alice and Alice with Justin, and I pray a blessing on that marriage. Thanks, Lord, for loving us and sending your son to save us, and it's in his precious name. Amen. All right, I want to read Psalms 138, and then we'll pray and get into our worship. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple and will praise your name. For your love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. When I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is on high, he looks upon the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hands against the anger of my foes. For your right hand, you save me. Or with your right hand, you save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to gather this morning uh, because we love you. We thank you for giving us this opportunity to gather as a body of believers. Lord, we thank you for Justin's service to this church and for all the service of all the different council members. Lord, I thank you for the gift of leadership that you have given all of those council members and for those that will be in the next few months joining council either to fill in these vacancies or the new terms. Lord, prepare our hearts as we prepare to worship you through song and then learning more about you. Be with Pastor Vaughn as he delivers the message this morning. Let all of us take the teachings from this church and from your word to be a light for you in the darkness of this community. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, church family. Um, so this morning, uh, Psalm 138 is the theme of the message. Um, so each song Bob went through and picked a song to go with each verse um, of Psalm 138. So I'm just going to read um, a little bit of each before each song we sing. Um, so starting with verse 1, I give you thanks, O Lord, with all my heart. I will sing your praises before the gods. I bow before your holy temple as I worship. I praise your name for your unfailing love and faithfulness. So will you please stand as we sing, He is Exalted.
continue on in Psalm 138. Every king in all the earth will thank you, Lord, for all of them will hear your words. Yes, they sing about the Lord's ways, for the glory of the Lord is very great. Now join me in singing to God be the glory. taken back by the part that says the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus to pardon receives. It just well, gets me every time. So I just needed to mention that. While we're standing, let's pray for the offering. Father, it is so wonderful to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ this morning. And it's so wonderful that we have this common bond of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we know that we are your workmanship and that we are created in Christ Jesus. So Father, our hearts are filled with praise our hearts are filled with thankfulness for what you have done for us. Father, we realize that our self-acceptance is because of what you have done for us and that you have created us in a wonderful, beautiful way that now we are perfect through the blood of Jesus Christ. So as we come and worship together, Father, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as the body of Christ, I pray that our praise is a pleasing aroma before your throne that as we sing these songs to bring you honor and glory and to praise you, Father, that it'll make you smile, that it'll make you pleased that you paid the price for our sins through your precious holy blood of your son, Jesus. Father, we also not only offer up our praises of uh, worship to you, we offer up our offerings to you, realizing that you are our good, good Father, as we're going to be singing about, and that we are loved by you, and everything we are and everything we have, Father, is a gift from you. So accept our thanks and praise for that. And I pray, Father, for your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding that we as a body of Christ can take this money and bring honor and glory to yourself as we reach out to the community around us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for your faithfulness. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to continue in Psalm 138. It says... Your promises are backed by all the honor of your name. As soon as I pray, you answer me. You encourage me by giving me strength. Um, so now we're going to sing Confidence, an old favorite. I'm not a warrior. I'm too afraid to lose. I feel unqualified for what you're calling. broken people are exactly 
And uh, Joy Juniors are dismissed. Um, the final section I'm going to read here: the power of your, I'm sorry, the power of your right hand saves me. The Lord will work out His plans for my life. For your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. Don't abandon me, for you made me. Um, for that, first we're going to sing "Good, Good Father," and Bob was kind of going on about how. The um, Lord is always with us, and really what matters is what God thinks of us. He made each of us, and we're each unique in our own way, and um, so that's what's most important, and we often have doubts about ourselves, but what's really important is who God made us to be and, and how much he loves us. So. <clears throat>
So this will be our last full message from Psalms. I so appreciate this morning our music team singing us through Psalms 138, and it moves us into Psalms 139, where we're going to be looking at in just a few moments. Just several prayer requests again I want to give to you. I want you to continue to remember Lisa Stauffer in prayer. Uh, she is in need of our prayer uh, recovering from her surgery. Uh, again, I want to continue to pray for Jai and Mandy and the passing of Feng Shua a few weeks ago and continue to, to pray for their family. If you saw the prayer bulletin this week, you saw the host at our family who lives here in East Donegal. Their house exploded. They had a fire and lost everything. So we want to certainly remember that family in prayer. And then for Bill Nisley, uh, Bill has been at home uh, and uh, been with hospice there at the house, and uh, this week sort of took a turn for the worse, and they really believe that Bill only has two or three, maybe four days to live. I saw him last night. He was not real responsive, so certainly we need to be praying for Sharon and for Sandy at uh, this difficult time. And then the last request, we're uh, just a, a week and a half away from Don Bell's surgery, so we want to remember him. So quite a few prayer requests this morning. Let's pray for these, and then we'll look at Psalms 139 together. Father in heaven, Lord, I come this morning again, Lord, thinking about these requests. I, I think of Jai and Mandy, and Lord, how, Lord... It, it's been difficult, Father, in feng shui's going home to be with you in that separation. And may you continue to minister grace to them at this time. Father, we certainly think of this family who lost everything this week. Lord, I, I pray that you might minister grace to them and, and help during this time. We pray for Lisa, that you would continue to be with her as, as she recovers from her surgery. Father, we think of... Um, Bill, and uh, Lord, thank you that he knows you as a Savior. Thank you that he shared with me several times that he's ready uh, whenever that time comes to go home to be with you. Father, we pray for Sharon and Sandy in these uh, days. Uh, Father, these last days of his life, may you minister grace and strength, and especially to Sharon as she takes care and ministers to her husband, Father. And Lord, we pray for Don, uh, Lord, as his surgery is coming up in a little over a week and a half, again, that uh, this surgery would go well and it would relieve him of the pain that he has been suffering for uh, over a month now. Continue to give him grace and strength, Father, in this difficult time. It's in your name we pray, amen. Psalms 139 this morning, 139, if you want to turn there, it's page 974 in the Pew Bible, page 974 in the Pew Bible. Sometimes when I watch movies, I cry. There's a movie that's real old, goes all the way back to 1995. Wow, that's old, isn't it? And uh, I don't know if any of you watched this movie, but it made me cry. In fact, this week I was watching some excerpts from it in the office preparing for this message, and, it, and, and tears were coming to my eyes. It's crazy. And I say to myself, why are you crying? This is crazy. But anybody remember the movie Mr. Holland's Opus? Yes. Anybody else cry at that movie? <laughs> yeah, I love, I love that movie. And I, and I know it's, it's an old movie, but it, it's, you know, it's the, it tracks 30 years of a man's life as he raises a family and he teaches music in school. But he goes beyond instructing his students. He pours his life into them. As the story unfolds, we discover that he took the teaching job because he couldn't make a living 
writing and composing the music that he wanted to. So this dream of composing a symphony was put on the back burner for more pressing matters. But it was always there vibrating in the back of his mind that that's what he wanted to do. And there was always a hope that he could write a piece of music. Then came the day after 30 years of teaching music in the high school, came the day because of financial cutbacks, they decided they were going to do away with the music program. His heart was broken. And he struggles with being put aside by the school board after so many years. Mr. Holland is left questioning whether his life has really mattered. He put his dream on hold to take up the daily goal of trying to impact the lives of teenagers through music. Now that too seemed to be gone. And in the one scene, not pretty close to the end of the movie, Mr. Holland sits in his classroom by himself on the last day and a teacher that he had made friends with, the football coach, walks in and they begin to conversation. Mr. Holland says, my life could have gone a different direction, but it didn't. And he says this, maybe I've failed. Maybe I've failed. Spent all this time investing in these young people's lives and maybe it really means nothing. And the football coach gets up and he said, your life has made a difference and he walks out. And then if you know the end of the movie, it's a very moving thing when he walks into the auditorium, it's filled with all of his old students and uh, his wife gives a speech uh, the governor comes and gives a speech. She was one of his students, and then the curtain opens, and they play his song. It's very moving. But what's moving to me is when Mr. Opus sits in that classroom by himself and says, has my, has my life really made a difference? Do you ever feel that way? I mean, deep down, when it's quiet, Everybody else is in bed, or maybe when you're driving down the road and you don't have to pay much attention and you begin to think about that. Do you ever pause and add up what your life amounts to and well? You say, I think it comes up short. Or maybe you just feel like a rat in the cage on that wheel, just spinning and spinning and spinning. Life is like a treadmill, this treadmill of the same old, same old every day. You're working hard, but it doesn't feel like you're getting anywhere. You feel underappreciated, overlooked, underpaid, or even unnecessary. There are many versions of Mr. Holland that people go through, I believe. And I think sometimes, especially as I sit and I talk to sometimes our older people and they look back at their life and it seems to have just been a blink and now they sit at the end of life and they wonder, did, did I really make a difference? Did I really matter? It seems to me that most people who take the time to reflect on their lives struggle with these incomplete feelings and dead-end thoughts. Some people wrestle with them every day. You take stock of your life and you say, what difference does it make? Does anybody really know or care about me? Then you're right, you're in the right place today if that's what you're thinking. Because Psalms 139 speaks about these things. Psalms 139 is a tremendous psalm that is an encouraging psalm. God wants to show us a different picture of our lives. He wants us 
to see the view from the top down instead of looking up. He wants us to see that our lives matter and they especially matter to him. Four truths this morning that I want to give you out of this portion of scripture. I hope these four truths that we find in this portion will be an encouragement to you this morning. Again, Psalms 139. The first truth is this. God knows you. God knows your heart. He knows your fears. He knows your thoughts. He knows your motives. He knows your dreams. He knows your frustration. He knows your past. He knows your present. He knows your future. He understands you. Sometimes we don't feel understood, but God understands you. He notices what's going on around you. He notices what's going on inside of you. He notices what you're going through. He gets it. In fact, God probably has you pegged better than you do. God knows us. And there are four simple things in this portion of Scripture that God knows. Look at verse 1 and 2. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. First of all, he knows your heart. God knows your heart. The Bible says our heart is what? It is desperately wicked. Who can know it? God knows your heart. He knows what's inside your heart. He knows. God knows everything about you. There's nothing about you that God is not aware. We've all been there. You remember growing up and you were a teenager, 12, 13 years old, and you did things and you thought to yourself, my parents will never know this, or at least I hope they never know it. <laughs> Some of you teens here today, you're saying the same thing. This week I did something I hope my parents never find out. But here's the reality of it. Listen to me this morning. God knows everything we do. See, our heart, our heart, out of the abundance, the heart, the, it says the man speaks. Our heart is where our emotions are. Our heart is really who we are. And yet God knows it. And here's the amazing fact. God still loves you. God still loves you. See, God's love is not based on your heart. God's love is based on the fact that God is love. I know my own heart. I know its motives sometimes are not good. I know my own heart. And I know that its emotions are not good sometimes. They're not under control. I know my heart. And my heart is desperately wicked, as the Bible says. It wants to go its own way. And yet in the midst of that, don't ever think that God stops loving you. God loves you no matter what. And we always need to hold on to this fact. God knows our heart and yet he still loves us. And not only does he know our heart, but look, he knows our actions. He knows our actions. He says, You discern, you discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. He knows your actions. He knows your character. He knows your conduct. 
He knows everything about you. I was 16 years old, and I was working at a place called Your Home Incorporated. I had built a friendship with probably somebody I shouldn't have built a friendship with, an older man. And uh, we stopped after dinner one night, or we stopped after work for dinner one night. In my home, you didn't drink alcohol. You just didn't drink. And... uh, I had never had a drink of alcohol, and that guy said, oh, listen, just one isn't going to hurt you. So what did I do? I had a daiquiri. I don't even know what that means today, (laughs) but that was the one drink I had. And I remember thinking about that all the way home. I went to bed and I lay there in my bed and I thought to myself, I know my mom and dad know what I did tonight. I know that. They they had no idea. But I got up the next morning and we were sitting around the table eating breakfast and I felt my father look at me and I said, Do you know what I did last night, Dad? And he said, no, and I told him. He looked at me and he said, son, listen. One drink of alcohol isn't going to send you to hell. He said, you know our rules. I'm not going to punish you. He said, I love you. He said, but at least thank you for admitting your actions to me. Here's the thing. Whether we admit them to God or not, God knows our actions. God knows. He knows our attitudes. He he knows everything. He knows our actions and what we do. He not only knows our actions, but it says he knows our words. He knows our words. God knows every conversation we have even before we say a single word. And certainly we understand why the book of James says that we need to be what? Slow to speak and quick to listen. That's why God gave us two ears and one mouth. Because he knew we would often say things that we shouldn't say. And even before we say them, even when we have them going on in our head, you know what I mean? You're thinking about what you want to say. God knows it. You don't hide from God. And then it even goes on in verses 5 and 6 that he says, he knows my life. He says, you hem me in behind and before me. You've laid your hand upon me. He says, God, you, you know my life. You know everything about it. You know the entire course of my life. And we're going to see that in just a few minutes when we see that he even has them written down in a book. And here's the amazing thing to me about this, is in the midst of this, God still loves me. God does not withdraw his love from me. He knows my heart. He knows my actions. He knows my words. He knows my inconsistency. He knows everything about me, and he still loves me. Sometimes Your own flesh will whisper into your head, God doesn't love you. Look what you've done. Look at those thoughts you've had. Look at those wicked things that you've looked at. Look at the evil that's in your heart. Look at your attitude. Look at your bitterness. Look at your resentment. Look at those things. How could God love you? Don't listen to those thoughts. They're from the pits of hell. God loves you no matter what. He loves us. He knows everything about us and he still loves us. And listen to what David, look at this next verse. Listen to what David says. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. 
It's too lofty for me to attain. David said, listen, I can't even understand this. And we know David's life. We know the things that David did. We know that David didn't live for God all the time. We know that David fulfilled his own desires of his flesh. And yet he knew that God cared for him and loved him no matter what. David said, I just, I can't even believe it. I can't even attain the thought in my mind. It's too wonderful. Not only does he know us, but God pursues us. God pursues you. You know, when you, when you think about our hearts and we... You know, we think about our actions and we think about our words. Sometimes when we think about our own life, and <clears throat> we, we go the wrong direction. Man, our, our immediate thought is, man, I just, just like for my parents, I wanted to hide. I just want to hide from God so he doesn't see me. And David sort of answers that question, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light becomes night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. David said, where can I go and hide? If uh, I know this. I, he knows me. He knows I'm a hypocrite. He's heard my lies. He saw what I did last week. Where can I go to escape him? There's nowhere. If I go to heaven, he's there. If I go to hell, he's there. No matter where I go, you can't hide from God. He tracks my path, David says. But not to point out your wrong or to exact justice from us. He's determined to give grace and to be involved in your life no matter what. And that's what David is saying. He's saying, listen, God, look there in verse 10. Even though your hand will what? Will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. He says, listen, God, you've affirmed that you want me. You love me. You care for me. You're going to give me guidance, God. You're going to give me security. There's security in God's right hand. And that's what that scripture is saying. Listen, God gives us security. Even when we're not what we're supposed to be. God loves us. You are wanted by God. You might, you might not feel like you were wanted by your parents. You might not feel sometimes like you're wanted by your spouse. You might not feel sometimes like you're even wanted by those who you work with. But listen to me. God wants you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants closeness with you. You are God's beloved. You are God's chosen. You are his dearly beloved children. We are told that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. When you feel the crushing weight of loneliness and wonder if you'd be missed if you were gone, remember this, God loves you. God desires a relationship with you. Some time ago, I read a story about a young girl. Her name was Mary Ann Bird. Mary Ann was born with a cleft palate. She hated going to school. She was made fun of by her classmates. She felt like she was looked over. 
She was a little girl with a misshapen lip, a crooked nose, a lopsided teeth, and garbled speech. When schoolmates would ask her, what happened, Mary? What happened to you? She would say, I fell on a piece of glass and cut my lip because she didn't want them. She thought that sounded more acceptable then this is what I've been like since birth, or I was just born different. There was, however, a second grade teacher, Mrs. Leonard, who made a difference in Mary's life. See, every year the class would have a hearing test. And every year they would line up and the teacher would say something, would whisper something, and the children would have to repeat what the teacher said. She might say, the sky is blue, and the student would have to say, the sky is blue. She might say, do you have new shoes? And the student would have to repeat, do you have new shoes? When it came Mary's turn, she said seven words that changed Mary's life. Seven simple words that will change her life forever. This is what she whispered to Mary. I wish you were my little girl. I wish you were my little girl. Those words changed her life forever. She said, I felt loved for the first time in my life. I want to tell you this morning, and I want to remind you that you are God's child. If you have a relationship, if you've come to that place in your life and you've asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, every day God wants to remind you, you are my child. I love you. I care for you. I understand what you're going through. I understand your heartbreak. I understand your pain. I understand what it was like to grow up in a home where you weren't really wanted. I understand what it was like to be rejected as a child. I understand what it means to be heartbroken because of a divorce. I understand what it means to lose a child. God has been through all of those things. God understands our heartbreak. God understands everything about us, and he loves us. And he wants to remind you that you are his child no matter what. Number three, God made you. I love this portion of this. God made you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. It's one of my favorite portions of Scripture. It's a portion of Scripture that tells us that life begins before birth. It begins at conception. And we as a church should always stand on that. And listen, we ought to always stand against abortion. It's out of the pits of hell. And listen to me this morning. Life begins at conception. God had everything about you written down in a book before you were even thought of. 
I love this portion of scripture. You are a perfect prescription from God. And I know this morning there might be some teenagers that are sitting here and you are wrestling with that thought of how you look or how you're made. And maybe you've even said to God, God, you cheated me. You didn't make me tall enough. Or God, you didn't give me this ability. God, you know, I'm, I can't play sports real well. God, I can't do this. And, and God saying, listen, I made you perfect. You are a perfect prescription from God. Every one of us in this room, there are people here with brown hair, with black hair, with no hair, with gray hair. There are people here this morning with blue eyes. There are people here this morning with green eyes. There are people here this morning with bloodshot eyes. <laughs> but listen to me. God made you the way you are. God made you the way you are. Every one of us should be able to stand in front of the mirror and say, God, thank you for making me this way. God, you gave me the height. God, now we can somewhat deal with the width. That's up to us. <laughs> but the reality is this, is God made us. You are a perfect prescription from God. Did you hear that? Did you hear that, teenager? You are a perfect prescription from God. God made you the way he, he made you. He gave you the abilities that you have. He gave you the personality that you have. Everything about you is perfect. God makes no junk. God makes no junk. He's never wrong. I've shared with you before. My mom uh, worked in public education. She worked as a secretary all of her career, and uh, most of her career anyway, in a school called the John G. Leach School. It was a, kid, it was a school for kids with uh, physical handicaps. And the buses would pull in and the kids would get off in wheelchairs. They would get off uh, with their bodies bent, um, wearing crutches and braces. And those kids would come and go to school every day there at that school. Her principal, my mom's principal that she worked for as a secretary, she would often argue with my mom that God made mistake. God makes mistakes. She would say, just look at these kids. They're mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. They are marks of God. God allowed that into their lives. God does not make mistakes. Sometimes he gives special marks on people, but God has a perfect plan even for them. I love that portion of scripture here this, where it says, I praise you because I am fearfully and what? Wonderfully. The word there, wonderful, means distinct. Distinct. Just like we say there's no two snowflakes that are alike. There are no two people that are alike. Every person is distinct. And that's what that word means. God made us wonderful. He made us distinct. Don't let anybody tell you that you are not wonderfully made. You are not perfect. You're a perfect prescription from God. And again, look at verse 16. All the days ordained for me was written in your book. God not only made you, lastly, God has a plan just for you. All your days were written in his book. He would planned them before a single day even happened. Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, God had a plan for your life. David says the script for your life was already written by God. The Lord has carefully mapped out the details that will fill your days. He's ordained what will happen in our life. He knows it. They're written in the book of life that is talked about here. The Hebrew word 
that David used here indicates that God has created each day of my life, tailoring my circumstances, establishing boundaries, and fashioning opportunities for his glory and for my good. God doesn't just set the plan in motion and look the other way. He is always there with us. Every morning giving us mercy and grace, fresh and new, that come along with the new opportunities. He knows you. He pursues you. He made you with a purpose and is ready to live out those plans with you each day. Will you allow yourself to hear his still small voice saying, I am so glad you're my child. I am so glad you are my child. That's what God is saying to you every day. Take my hand and let's go together through life. Two $20 bills. Thanks to Scott Hershey. I forgot mine. I left mine on my dresser. and <laughs> I realized that and I went out and said, does anybody have any money? And Scott had two 20s. So if I offered you this $20 bill, how many of you would take it? Come on. Yeah, we, we would all take it, right? If I offered it to you, you would take it. So how about if I went like this? Would you take it now? Is it worth any less? No, it's not, is it? Is it worth less than this one that seems to be perfect? No. I know some of us sit here this morning, and this is what we feel like. We feel like we've been stepped on. We feel like we've been crushed. But we're not worth any less than this one. You're worth just as much to God as anybody else. You're worth just as much to God as anybody else who sits in the pew next to you. God loves us. You may feel like you've been stepped on, beat up, kicked around. You may feel dirty. You may feel unworthy. You may feel useless. Just know this. You matter to God. Maybe your parents have said words that still ring in your ears even to this day. Or maybe they didn't see, say words that you were longing to hear. Maybe your spouse has rejected you verbally or emotionally or physically Don't let what other humans do define you. Don't draw conclusions about yourself based on them. Look higher. Look to God who you're there. You're his child and he loves you and cares for you. Psalms 139 tells us that God loves us, he cares for us, he made us a perfect prescription, and he has a perfect plan for each of our lives. Yes, sometimes that plan hurts. Sometimes that plan is difficult, but you are worth no less than anybody else, no matter what you've been through. Let's pray. Maybe you sit here today and you say, Dick, you know, I, I sort of feel 
sometimes like that dollar that you threw down and you crushed and you stepped on. I, I can't even begin to imagine some of the heartache that's represented here in this auditorium. I know some of it. I've, I've said, I've talked with many of you. I've heard your stories. I know what you've been through. But I'm here to remind you today that you have a God who loves you, a God who loved you so much that he made you perfect, a God who loved you so much that he saw your plight. He saw your sinfulness. And so he did something about it. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sin. And if you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with God, I would encourage you today to talk with me after the service or talk to Pastor Keith or talk to one of us so that you know that you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to remind our teenagers this morning, listen, don't listen to what the world says about you or about your body or how you were made or how you're not right. You are a perfect prescription from God. Parents, you need to remind your kids that all the time. God made you perfect. Yeah, we have sin, I know that. But physically, emotionally, the, the, the gifts and the abilities that he gave us, he chose those things for each of us because he loves us so much. Remember in those moments of quietness and loneliness, when you ask yourself, does my life matter? Your life matters to God. Your life matters so much to God. Don't ever forget that. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, even though we're not worthy of it, even though our thoughts aren't what they need to be, even though our heart is desperately wicked at times, Father, even though we say things we shouldn't say at times, Lord, you still love us. We, we can never not be your, stop being your child. Once we're saved, Father, Lord, you continue to love us. You continue to watch over us. You continue to take care of us. Even though in those times when we live in our flesh, Instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to control, you love us. Lord, we are so thankful for that. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand and join me in singing the final song, Everywhere I Go? And let us just be reminded that God is with us wherever we go in life.
your fire in my soul your kingdom is my home and i don't walk alone your breath upon these bones your fire in my soul your kingdom Thank you for worshiping with us today. As you leave, turn to the person next to you and tell them, you are a perfect prescription from God. Hey, Don.